Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing discussion of 1968. In the previous lectures, we've talked a little bit about the Mexico City Olympics and some of the tensions surrounding those games. In particular, we've talked about some of the protests of black athletes around the world and particularly African American athletes leading up to the Olympics. In this final lecture discussing those Olympics, we'll talk about what happened with those protests and a little bit more about the events of the Olympics themselves. I concluded the last lecture by mentioning that the potential boycott by African American athletes crumbled in the months before the Games. And indeed, those African American athletes would attend and participate in the Olympics, but there would be individual protests, which I'll mention shortly. In other lectures, I talked about some of the other tensions in Mexico before the Olympics, most notably by far being the student protests of that summer and the massacre in Sotoloco, which took place 10 days before the opening games. So there was plenty of controversy and tension leading up to the Olympics. And yet, as things got started in October 1968 in Mexico City, the Olympics actually went off almost entirely peacefully there were only a handful of very minor protests that occurred during the games and a few controversies and of course the black power protest which I'll get to shortly but otherwise the Olympics largely achieved what the Mexicans hoped that is portraying to the world a vision of a largely peaceful harmonious and modern nation capable of organizing the largest athletic event in the world and pulling it off without a hitch while they might have come close to not having a few of the facilities ready, they did manage to pull off what some people in Olympic circles describe as another Mexican miracle, getting the Olympics done without major issues. There were a number of interesting and unique elements of these Olympics. Perhaps the most notable was known as the Cultural Olympics. There have always been cultural elements and aspects to the Olympic festival. But the Mexicans really played up this side of things. And in fact, the entire year leading up to the Olympics was packed with cultural events uh, in Mexico City and other parts of the country. They invited nations from all over the world to participate in these cultural Olympics. They sent artists, performers, plays and pageantry, musical groups, and all kinds of other things throughout the entire year leading up to the Olympics. One of the arguments that organizers of the Mexico Games made was that accentuating the cultural side of things allowed smaller nations, perhaps less developed nations, or those that couldn't afford to pour huge amounts of money into their athletic programs, could still have kind of equal footing to show off their better side to the world. And so there, there came to be an aspect of this that was similar to a World's Fair as opposed to the Olympics. And uh, the Cultural Olympics were hugely popular with uh, visitors from all over the world. And in fact, the cultural aspect of Olympics since then has really been accentuated. So again, on the whole, the Olympics went off peacefully. There was all the usual kind of pageantry and celebration associated with the Games. There were new additions to things like the opening ceremonies and the way things proceeded. Uh, Mexico City was richly decorated for the Olympics, as every host city and host country does. And again, one of the major themes of the Olympics was peace, and they released thousands of doves during the opening ceremony, and that was one of the things that uh, was very prominently featured in all of the logos and artistry associated with the games. And of course, there have been many who kind of commented on the irony of uh, peace being one of the major themes of the Olympics when they had just engaged in a slaughter of uh, their own citizens less than two weeks before the start of the Olympics. Um, nonetheless, as the world's attention and uh, media descended on the country, again, the Olympics, for the most part, went off very well. One of the elements of these Olympics that had created concern 
was the thin air and elevation of Mexico City. And while there have been high altitude events um, really throughout the sporting history of the world, there was still real uncertainty as to whether the uh, altitude would create problems for some of the athletes. But it actually ended up having uh, an unforeseen kind of side effect, and that is that uh, a cascade of world and Olympic records fell in many, many different events. And particularly in track and field, uh, world records were broken in almost every event in the sprints and in many field events as well. Now, the altitude did uh, lead to some suffering for those in long distance events, and there were some athletes that seemed to struggle more than others. But on the whole, it created a very exciting atmosphere, uh, particularly around the track and field events where the thin air over a short term, it really kind of aids sprinters who are running through thinner air or those who are jumping and leaping uh, as well. Where it has a detriment is in the longer distance events where people struggle to maintain their oxygen levels and to breathe effectively. So there were many world's records uh, that fell, lots of exciting events, particularly in track and field, and among the most memorable performances were those of the long jumper, Bob Beeman. And you see one of the very famous pictures of these Olympics uh, there on the lower right-hand corner is Bob Beeman in the midst of uh, his world record shattering long jump uh, in which he broke the world record in the long jump by more than two feet, which is uh, just an astonishing number in an event like the long jump where typically the world record inches its way forward uh, just that in inches or fractions of an inch and in this case he shattered the world record by more than two feet and then at the top another of the uh, famous kind of performers at these Olympics was the high jumper Dick Fosbury who had created a new approach in the high jump event which came to be called the Fosbury flop where as you see in the picture he actually jumped over the bar backwards and head first as opposed to the traditional western roll technique where jumpers kind of flew themselves over the bar sideways one leg first and then kind of uh, flopping over it and uh, in this case Dick Fosbury used this kind of backwards approach and uh, broke the Olympic record in the high jump and had three attempts at the world record which he didn't break, but nonetheless, he was still one of the, the favorite athletes of the Olympics. So on the whole, the athletic competitions were uh, very exciting. Many records fell. As with every Olympics, there were a number of athletes who were particular favorites uh, with the fans and with the media. And so in that regard, these Olympics were, uh, were particularly spectacular um, and have drawn a lot of attention from fans of the Olympics and uh, historians of the sport as well. So the athletic competitions were certainly exciting and led to a lot of broken world's records. But without question, these Olympics are most remembered for the medal stand protest of Tommy Smith and John Carlos, the two African-American sprinters who raised their fists in what has typically been referred to as a black power salute while they were on the medal stand following the 200 meter race which took place a few days into the Olympics so it was relatively early on. That Smith and Carlos were on the medal stand was really not a surprise. These were two of the elite sprinters in the world. Tommy Smith typically was the favorite in this distance um, John Carlos, who was the best in the world at the 100 meters, and so he had a, uh, a stronger kind of sprint, but tended to fall back a little bit uh, as the distance approached 200 meters. But he was still elite in this race as well, and they were surely uh, favored as one and two heading into this race. But it is the Olympics, and there were world-class runners uh, from all over the world competing, and it's never a sure thing that one is going to reach the medal stand. And so they had to compete in the races first to get there. And there were some question marks. Tommy Smith 
uh, suffered a thigh injury during his semifinal heat. There was a brief period where it was thought he might not be able to run in the final, but uh, he pushed through and, and did run. And then the nature of the the final race itself and how these two runners came to be situated on the medal stand, there's a, a whole story behind that as well. As John Carlos, as he was wont to do, uh, the 100-meter the specialist, got out to a significant lead in the race and then clearly did slow up in about the final 60 or 70 meters. And actually, if you watch footage of the race, he's visibly looking uh, to his left. He's looking around to see if Tommy Smith is coming, which, of course, he was. Tommy Smith, his nickname was Tommy Jets, and he had uh, an incredible finishing kick in this event, the 200 meters. He took a little bit longer to get up to full speed, but nobody had the finish that Tommy Smith did. And in fact, he was catching up to John Carlos and blew past him and everybody else in the final 50 meters or so uh, of the race and broke the world record in the process at uh, 19.83 seconds. By slowing up just a little bit and by looking around to see if Tommy Smith was coming, John Carlos actually allowed another runner uh, the white Australian sprinter, Peter Norman, to sneak up and catch him at the line. And so it was Peter Norman who actually won the silver medal, uh, finishing second. And so he now is etched in history and, and very famously is standing uh, in the front of this scene on the medal stand uh, as he won the silver medal and John Carlos won the bronze medal, finishing third. Smith and Carlos, as I described in other lectures, were among the most militant of the black athletes, and they had been at the forefront of the boycott movement um, prior to the Olympics. And so there was a lot of discussion that they might be among those who would do some sort of protest at the Games. Still, in the aftermath of the race, and of course the, the focus had to be on the race itself and getting to the medal stand, and so they didn't have a whole lot of time to pre-plan and think about what they would do. But between them and their wives, they had arranged for a few items um, to be available should they decide to protest. And so they had one pair of black gloves, which they shared with Tommy Smith wearing the right-hand glove and John Carlos wearing the left-hand glove. Um, Smith was wearing a black scarf. John Carlos wore a black shirt and uh, a set of love beads. They both took off their shoes and had um, black socks as they stood on the medal stand. And Tommy Smith later explained some of the symbolism behind these items. He said, I wore a black right-hand glove and Carlos wore the left-hand glove in the same pair. My raised right hand stood for power in black America. Carlos's raised left hand stood for the unity of black America. Together, they formed an arch of unity and power. The black scarf around my neck stood for black pride. The black socks with no shoes stood for black poverty in racist America. The totality of our effort was the regaining of black dignity. And so as the American national anthem played, they bowed their heads and raised their fists and remained in that position throughout the playing of the national anthem. And then they were ushered off the field after. They both raised their fists once or twice more as they left the field. And there was kind of a mixed response from the crowd in the stadium. Uh, there were definitely some jeers and some boos. There was also some cheering and many people really not sure what was going on or what had happened in that moment. Olympic officials and most notably IOC uh, Chief Avery Brundage was incredibly upset at this action on the medal stand. There had been some warnings issued about protests during the Olympics, and Avery Brundage was uh, beside himself in the aftermath of this. And so the American Olympic Committee uh, did respond by ordering that the athletes be sent home. They had to leave the Olympic Village, and while they didn't leave Mexico right away, they both did go back to the United States before the closing ceremonies at the end of the Olympics. They did get to keep their medals. 
Uh, and then there were questions about what would happen next with other athletes. There had been many athletes who participated in the boycott movement, and the th there was wondering whether they would um, protest as well. The American Olympic Committee and uh, International Olympic Committee issued warnings against other protests. And so there were a few athletes who did things, but they really didn't uh, create quite the same stir as uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos. There were a few other athletes who raised their fist on the medal stand and things like that. But for the most part, they listened uh, attentively as the national anthem was played. And then there were other athletes like George Foreman, uh, the boxer who won the, the American, who won the gold medal in heavyweight boxing. And in the aftermath, he paraded around the boxing ring, um, brandishing a tiny American flag and chanting United States power. And so, you know, there were some who viewed this as a, a direct kind of parody or attack on the protest of Smith and Carlos and others. And in fact, George Foreman had been uh, upset, as I mentioned in previous lectures, that he was not included or invited uh, into the Olympic Project for Human Rights prior to the Olympics. With their protests, Smith and Carlos really introduced a new aspect of politics into the Olympics. That is direct protest on the medal stand and using uh, the events and the moments within the Olympics themselves uh, for athletic protest. And that really hadn't been done before. And while it has happened at times since then, uh, it created great concern among Olympic officials, this idea that the Olympics and politics are separate and should always be separate uh, is much harder to maintain when athletes like Smith and Carlos bring their protest directly to the medal stand. Incidentally, both Smith and Carlos paid a great price for their protest. Um, and in the aftermath, they were essentially blackballed from Olympic activities and other sporting activities. Uh, each of them kind of suffering in their own ways. The ROTC back at uh, San Jose State University would not let Tommy Smith back in after the Olympics, and his amateur um, track career was finished because he had been banned by the United States Olympic Committee. He tried out for a couple of NFL teams, but only was able to catch on for a brief time, and then he never really... Uh, caught on fully with the NFL. And so in the aftermath of that, what does uh, one of the great track athletes in the world do when he can't participate in track and when one of the only kind of lucrative opportunities uh, playing in the NFL was closed to him? And so he kind of bounced around for many years uh, in the aftermath before finally, decades later, managing to kind of rejoin the track community and catching on as a track coach at Santa Monica College and elsewhere. And John Carlos struggled mightily in the aftermath as well. He did continue competing as a sprinter for a, a couple of more years after that in various events. He could compete uh, in NCAA events. He also um, caught on for a brief time in the NFL, but like Tommy Smith, he really didn't have uh, an extended or well-paying career in the NFL, and he was relatively quickly out of the league. And then he as well, um, for many years, uh, found it a great struggle to find work um, and essentially was on the verge of homelessness and poverty um, for many years ended up having issues with drugs uh, before he eventually caught on again with uh, the track and field community. And other black athletes struggled as well. There were those who just sort of by association with the black protests uh, and Smith and Carlos, there were a number of um, sporting communities that were leery of attaching themselves with any of these athletes and so uh, sprinters like Jim Hines, who won the gold medal in the 100-meter dash, believed that NFL teams denied him an opportunity because of Smith and Carlos and their uh, 
um, protest. And all of these athletes struggled to catch on with sponsorship offers and shoe companies and, and things like that. Eventually, Smith and Carlos and their reputation was really restored by the 1990s as historians, students at San Jose State University and others began to look back again on the events of the 1960s, their, their perspective uh, changed. And Smith and Carlos and their action was seen by many as heroic. And you started to see the image on posters and on t-shirts. Uh, and they were embraced by many in the United States for their actions. And I think that's the prevailing opinion now. Um, most Americans look back on Smith and Carlos and their protest as one of the iconic images of the late 1960s. It's kind of hard to imagine 1968 without that image of Smith and Carlos on the medal stand. But it took decades of suffering and being ostracized and kind of outcast before they finally found their way back into favor. So as we conclude this discussion of the 1968 Olympics, we've now kind of returned to events on the American home front. And as we start to push towards the conclusion of this course and through the final lectures of this course, we come once again to the American home front where we will revisit issues like race, civil rights efforts, the election of 1968, and a number of other social and cultural issues on the American home front. <laughs>